Welcome once again to Calvary Baptist Church. My name is Frank Snyder, I'm the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church of Quincy, Michigan. And this is whatever week it is in quarantine. It is uh, today's date is May 6th. And uh, glad, I am glad that you've decided to join us, uh, join me on this Wednesday. And uh, trust that you will uh, glean uh, something from God's word for your heart and your life during uh, this time of um, pandemic quarantine. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 5. And specifically, we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 5 uh, in our study this evening. And so, um, get your Bible, if you don't already have it. And turn there to Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 initially, and then we're going to be just taking a peek at what God's Word says here. In verse 1 of chapter 5 of the book of Romans, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Let's go to God in just a brief word of prayer, shall we? Our God and Father, we thank you for this portion of your word that we're going to look at this evening. Uh, You have included it here by inspiration and uh, by your sovereign will. And we know that it's for um, your glory and our benefit. So help us tonight as we look uh, at this passage. Uh, May we listen attentively attentively, and help me to speak it clearly and, and teach about it clearly. Thank you for your goodness to us person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, in in whose name we pray. Amen. In 1913, a lady by the name of Eleanor Porter published a book which later became a bestseller. It sold over a million copies and spawned a whole line of books. It was a famous, if not the most famous children's book for many, many years. The book tells of a little girl whose father, who was a minister, died, leaving her orphan. Her only relative was an unpleasant and severe aunt in the state of Vermont who took her in. But this little girl, despite the hardships she had in life, was an optimist who somehow managed to find a bright side to everything that happened. Her her favorite word was glad. And she enjoyed her glad game in which she tried to find something in every situation, no matter how bad, to be glad about. The book was dramatized in 1916 and later made into a movie with the famous actress Mary Pickford. It was later remade by Disney, starring the actress Haley Mills, and into a BBC production a few years later. The title of the book was The Name of the Little Girl, and you may have already guessed that her name was Pollyanna. Her name even became, her name Pollyanna, even became a part of the American vocabulary. And people called someone a Pollyanna if they were perceived to have had a foolishly optimistic outlook or was excessively happy in the face of negative circumstances. They called her a Pollyanna, or someone like that, a Pollyanna. Someone who denies reality is sometimes called that. To be called a Pollyanna was the equivalent of being called flighty, or naive, or an airhead, or a space cadet, or you know what I'm talking about. Someone who, by denying reality, tries to escape into a fanciful world of positive thinking. Now the word Pollyanna is not used much anymore. Christians are 
when it is used, it is sometimes used of Christians who are accused of being Pollyannish. Uh, and this is especially so when passages such as Romans chapter 5 and verses 3 through 5 are talked about. Notice what he says in verse 3, for instance. He says, but not only so, but we glory in tribulation. Glory in tribulation. He is saying that we have an, a, a, a joyous exultation in tribulations, in trouble. He's saying that there is a gladness in the midst of trouble. Now, this is not something new or unusual in the scripture. It says this in other places as well. It says something similar in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, where Paul says, I take pleasures and infirmities and reproaches and necessities. And he goes on and then he said, for when I am weak, then I am, I am uh, strong. He, he says it, uh, the, God's word says in another place in James chapter 1, verse 12, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. So it's not an unusual, it is not an unusual theme in scripture that we can have a perspective of hard times and difficult circumstances, which is not despairing. Quite honestly, it's hard to relate to people who really do this. If we if we find someone that has this take on circumstances, in other words, that bad stuff that happens or negative stuff that happens is somehow good, we think that they must be in denial. And, you know, you wonder, you know, what kind of drugs are they on? What are they smoking? Okay. But there is, there is for a, a believer, a explanation, an explanation here in the text that explains this phenomenon. And it's not being in denial, and it doesn't have anything to do with taking drugs. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has already laid the groundwork for this in previous chapters in the book of Romans. Now, we're not going to take the time to go through uh, the first, first four chapters of the book of Romans, but very briefly, in chapters one, three, two, <laughs> 1 through 3, he has told us that mankind in general, and you as an individual, have a sin problem, you and I, that makes us unacceptable to God. Chapter 4 tells us that Jesus died on the cross to give us God's righteousness in place of our sinful state, our guilt. And so in order that we can be acceptable to God. And when a person turns to Christ in repentance and faith, they are counted righteous, not just innocent, but righteous in God's sight by virtue of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, in a, in a nutshell, that's chapters 1 through 4 of the book of Romans. And that they're explaining all of this, we see in chapters 5, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that we have at least three things. Now, if you're there, still there in the book of Romans, and I hope you are, he talks about being uh, having the having peace with God. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, and this is real, objective peace with God. It's not a feeling of peace. It's not uh, a, a, an emotional state. It is a state of peace. It is like if you are having a terrible argument with somebody and you finally get it settled, there is peace between you and your friend. That is a state of peace. So because we're being justified by virtue of what Jesus has done on the cross, we have peace with God. And we have access to by faith into grace. Notice what he says in verse 2. By whom? By Jesus. Also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. The grace that we are in right now, this, this favor from God, by virtue of what we experienced in justification through Christ, is where we stand. It's undeserved favor. If you are a saved person, if you are a Christian, you are standing in God's undeserved favor by Christ. And then in verse uh, uh, 2, he says that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So we have peace with God, we have a position with grace, and we have a glorious expectancy. We rejoice in hope, expectation, that's the idea of hope, of the glory of God. So we have, we rejoice because we know 
we have a hope, a confident expectation that we will see the glory of God both in ourselves and in his exaltation. So then in verse 3, he says something in addition to this, that all of this that we'd have. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. So in addition to all of all of what he has detailed for us in chapters 1 through 4, and then in the first few verses that, that, uh, of chapter 5, he says, being made right with God in Christ and being perpetually in his favor with this glorious expectation. That's great. That's wonderful stuff. But then he says in verse 3, and not only so, not, not just that, but we glory in tribulations also. What he is telling is, us is that tribulations, trouble, if you will, is received in a new way. Um, what are tribulations? Well, the word in the, in the original is the word thalipsis, which means, which means pressure, distress, stresses, affliction. Uh, we could go on to say that it means problems, illnesses, pain, conflicts, persecution, disloyalty to others, betrayals, difficulties, attacks, coronaviruses. We could talk about how this, that what he's referring to as tribulations includes pandemics. Anything that causes you grief has a context of tribulation. And so he's saying here that this trouble, we glory in tribulation. The, the issues, the problems which we encounter in life. And not only we have this, we receive trouble in a new way, but we glory. It's what we exalt him. There is a sense of satisfaction and peace and even exaltation in going through the problems that God has us going through. There is a sense of exalting in those things. Now, you might think to yourself, what crazy person thinks this way, that they glory in problem. It's like you're, you're saying that you enjoy pain. It's like saying you enjoy grief. You know, almost universally, society thinks that, that if someone is hurting themselves and enjoying it, or if they're going through uh, pain and enjoying it, that there's something wrong with them. It's not normal behavior. And usually when it happens, that person is trying to blot out some other kind of pain, uh, using pain to blot out other pain. And, and uh, we, But we think to ourselves, that is not normal. But that is what, in a sense, that is what he is saying in terms of us who have been given all of this, these blessings in Christ. And he says, not only so, we glory in tribulation. So how can we see it that way? How can we glory in it? Well, he gives us the answer in these verses. Knowing, notice what he says, but we glory in tribulations also knowing. And here's where he begins to explain how we can have a new perspective on our the issues of life that enter in that cause us pain or cause us trouble. It is based, my friend, on what you know to be true. Knowing, uh, these things, there's a popular expression in the world, what you don't know uh, can't hurt you. Well, contrary to popular opinion, what you do not know can hurt you a lot. If you do not know that for you as a believer that your problems have meaning apart from just the happenstance events that occur in life, that perspective of life can hurt you. You can become a bitter, cynical wretch of a human being, useless to God, useless to others, and useless really to yourself. You could become depressed and discouraged with the Christian life and want to quit. You can become negative and critical with people and influence others in a bad direction. So he is going to tell us something that we need to know. And the knowing of it influences our per perception of trouble that enters into our lives. So this exaltation, this glorying in tribulations, is predicated upon what you know. And it's based upon the expected outcome of it all. There is a kind of divine domino effect 
in what God does in the lives of believers through problems and trouble. You may not be familiar with the with the term domino effect. It it really um, uh, back in the fifties and the sixties, communism was spreading uh, uh, throughout the world, and uh, the theory was if one country accepts, accepts communism, it wouldn't be long before the next country uh, along its borders or another country uh, began to uh, accept communism as well. It had to do with the idea of dominoes. Most of us know what dominoes, those little rectangular game pieces, and we would stack them up one by one by one by one, and then you topple one and it hits the next one, hits the next one, hits the next one, and all of them begin to fall down. Well, the domino theory was that communism had that effect among nations. Well, in a sense, God has a domino effect for those who are justified by his grace in Christ. It is his use of trouble to affect a perfecting influence. Trouble, for you and I, has meaning. It has design. It has a context. Suffering has meaning. It causes something. It's not just a meaningless suffering out of context with everything. The world, the unbelieving world, has no context for hardship. It is just stuff that happens to us. Paul is telling though us here as believers that the trouble that we go through as believers has a context. Now notice what he said. He says that that uh, tribulation, look at verse 3, knowing, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. Now that word patience is the word uh, in the original, persistence. Patience, the word translated, means steadfastness, endurance, constancy, perseverance, consistency. These words can be summarized with the word persistence, hence the word patience. The idea is one of, in, of endurance. And the idea is that God brings trouble into your life so that you will endure, so you won't be a quitter. God does not want your strength to be small. And the only way for your strength to be big is through adversity. You don't, you don't get strong muscles by lifting fountain pens. You get strong muscles by lifting weights that are, that are very heavy. Uh, I've never seen feathers in a, in a weight room, in a workout room. Those weights are made of metal. Stamina is not built on the lazy boy recliner. Stamina is built on the roadway or on the treadmill or the mountain trail. Some people think that the greatest joy of bike riding is coasting down a hill. No, it's going up the hills that prove endurance. Anyone can coast. Achievers go uphill. So what God is saying here, he says, tribulation works endurance. It's the idea that the adversity that you encounter then results in a persistence in in endeavor. I don't much care for horses. I'm not. A, I'm I'm allergic to them for one thing. But I I do think they're pretty animals. And but I just don't care for riding them much, for a number of reasons. Um, but one in particular was a memory that I have as a teenager, when my the youth group that I was a part of uh, went to a riding stable. And. We all got on our horses, and the, the, the person at the stable was leading off, and I was the very last person in line, uh, probably 15 to 20 uh, young people on horses going up through the hill, hills there. And my horse must have known that I was a greenie because we got about 200 yards away from the barn, and he decided he was not going riding that day. And so, to my surprise, he turned around rapidly and began on a full gallop back to the uh, barn and uh, bolted with me on his back. And I was hanging on for all I was worth. I never had ridden a horse really much at all before. I finally got him stopped. And I must have looked like the Lone Ranger because when I got him down, he was right almost by the barn. He reared up on his hind legs and was fighting me. And I finally got him turned and he realized that I wasn't going to let him go back to the barn that day. 
He finally complied, and I complied rather, and I felt rather triumphant as we joined the rest of the writers. But as we were plodding along, I got kind of bored, and I kind of slumped down on my seat like so, and was just kind of loosely hanging onto the reins. And we came to this little dried up stream bed and all of the other horses in front of me, they stepped down into the stream bed and walked up the other side. My, my horse decided that he was going to jump when he got to the edge of that dried stream bed. And I don't know how many of you have ever rolled off the south end of a horse. I did not expect him to jump. And so when I'm riding there, I rolled, I mean, literally rolled right off his backside and hit the ground uh, behind him on on my backside. And then he went on ahead, still following the horses, but he went on ahead uh, to them. Well, I'm, I'm sitting there, and uh, the only thing that really got hurt was my pride, because I was very embarrassed. Um, I suppose what I could have said is, I'm done. After the episode of him running back to the barn and fighting all that, and then and then having him dump me, I could have just said, I am done with horse riding. And people were laughing, uh, I, but I got up, I chased that horse down and got back on. Trouble, friend, can make you quit. Trouble can make you uh, discouraged. Trouble can also make you committed. If, when it comes, you determine to be committed, and the results, the result of that will be patience, steadfastness, endurance, constancy, perseverance, and persistence. If that is the, the net effect, if that is the desired effect, notice what comes next in the text here. Knowing that tribulation works endurance, consistency, persistence, translated patience, and then in verse 4, and patience, experience. Now, that word experience is means proven reliability. Uh, I, in the King James, it does say experience, but the idea that the translators were trying to convey here is the idea of reliability and trustworthiness. Let me ask you a question. I, I have never gone skydiving. Maybe someone that's listening, you have gone skydiving. Uh, but if you were going to take skydiving lessons, would you rather take lessons from someone who had taken 10 jumps or someone that has made 1,000 jumps? Now, think about that. Uh, I think that if I was going to take skydiving lessons, I would much rather have the individual that had already completed 1,000 jumps. Why? Is it simply because he survived that long? No. If he has successfully completed a thousand jumps, it means he has probably encountered every problem personally that could possibly happen outside of forgetting his parachute. He has probably had his parachute cord fail. He has probably avoided colliding with other jumpers. Maybe he has collided with other jumpers and knew what to do. He has probably uh, encountered updrafts and downdrafts. He's probably experienced some hard landing. Perhaps he's even gotten jolted a time or two, maybe even broken a bone or two, but still he jumped. There's something about the persistence of someone like that, someone in the face of adverse situations and still continues, still is, is patiently enduring, that has given him something that someone who has quit does not have. I don't know about you, but uh, if I was going to take skydiving lessons, the person that made a thousand jumps would be the one I would want to uh, jump out of an airplane with. That is the person I want to teach me. He has demonstrated a reliability and a dependability that others have not demonstrated. You ever watch those commercials? Uh, not so much anymore, but uh, there used to be a commercial for the Dodge uh, truck company, and they would have these Dodge trucks and take them over uh, rough terrain. Uh, and one particular one, they had a helicopter copter drop a Dodge truck like 40 feet uh, from the air. to And it was to demonstrate how rugged the Dodge trucks were. They put them through all kinds of ordeals to show them how reliable uh, they are. And then at the end of the commercial, the guy with the gravelly voice says, Dodge trucks, built tough. Okay? What is the objective 
of showing, what is the purpose of showing all that those Dodge trucks uh, have gone through? What, what is the end result? What they are trying to show is the proven reliability of those trucks. Now, for a believer who has found their peace with God, they stand through Jesus Christ in the favor of God. They have the glorious expectation of a future with God. That same believer can trust his present with God as well. That is why Paul says of an inspiration of the Spirit of God, and not only so, I mean, we have, we're justified, we have peace with God, we have a glorious expectation, but he says, and not only so, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation, that trouble works endurance, and that endurance produces proven reliability. That's the domino effect. Trouble produces persistence. Produce, persistence produces experience. But then he goes on to say, and this proven reliability, this persistence, this uh, experience, produces a confident expectation. That is the word in verse 4, hope. Now, many of you think that pastors do not get discouraged. I have periodically gotten very discouraged. It has been uh, during those times that of discouragement that I have had to talk to myself. Now, not in a crazy sort of way. Um, I have to remind myself that my present circumstances notwithstanding, God is on the throne, that God is sovereign. He has been on the throne through thick and thin. I have seen him work in the past through negative circumstances. I've seen in God's word, the scripture, that uh, over and over in the scripture where God has worked even through negative circumstances and that he will continue to work that way. I have seen him work in my life by allowing a life-threatening illness into my life that some 21 doctors could not figure out. He worked blessing in my life and in the lives of others through that, that illness. I had circumstances in my first ministry that nearly drove me out of the ministry, and yet God has used that experience time and time again in my life and in the lives of other pastors. Those experiences, though that tribulation, those tribulations have produced a confident expectation that God will prevail. It is a hope that the scripture says, make it not ashamed. It does not disappoint. It doesn't let you down. So a believer glories in tribulations knowing what they do, what they accomplish, that they're not happenstance, that they're not random events, that these are things that God has allowed into your life and into my life for his glory and your benefit, for what they produced. Some years ago, I watched a program on military boot camp. In this case, it was the Marine Corps. And it particularly focused on the drill sergeants or the drill instructors. Recruits would come in there and the drill instructors would, would cuss the recruits and scream at them and say all kinds of humiliating statements to them. They would wake them up in the wee hours of the morning this way, screaming for them to get up and get ready for a forced march. And they would, we, they would be made to crawl through mud and filth. And I thought to myself, if that guy was doing that to me, I think I would hate that guy. I would want to punch that guy. If he called me a sissy, I, I would want to, you know, I would want to do something. Give him such a pinch. You know, I would not respond positively toward the drill instructor. Curiously enough, the recruits did not feel that way about the drill instructors at all. In fact, they all seemed to admire and have affection for the drill instructor by the time they graduated boot camp. In fact, many said that they loved their drill instructor because of what they knew about him. They knew that what he was trying to do was save their lives and keep them from getting killed by the enemy. They said that they loved the drill instructor because they knew that he was trying to make them the very best Marine they could be. They knew the drill instructor was trying to make out of raw recruits effective fighting men 
that were willing and able to defend their country. Now this is crucial. Their response toward that drill instructor was based upon what they knew. Put, they were put through horrible, horrible conditions. Special forces military is even, is even more uh, 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 taxing. Who would ever have thought they would appreciate that abuse coming from their drill instructor? But that is just it. In their minds, it was not abuse. You might be thinking, God, why are you putting me through the circumstances that you are putting me through right now? His, he answers back, I know it hurts, my child, but it's not abuse. It has purpose. Paul is saying, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, in chapters 1 through 4, he's saying, look what God has done in the person and work of Christ. And so and then chapter 5, so we are now justified, counted righteous before a holy God. We have peace. Because of that, we have peace with God. And we have access by, into the grace of God through faith. And we rejoice in the glory of God. And we glory in tribulations also, knowing, knowing. This is based on what you know. It's not being a Pollyanna to acknowledge this and to be able to view tribulations in this way. All, is ba all of this is, is in the prospect or in the idea of knowing that you understand the, the God of heaven's purposes. Now, you may not understand the details, okay? Because there are a lot of things that we, we, we're just not going to see this, kind, this side of heaven. But we can know that God has purpose. What you know is that the God who has shed abroad his love in our hearts has our best interests in mind in accordance with his purpose for you, for us. And you must ask yourself, my friend, if you know this. It's important for you to know that you are justified through what Jesus has done on the cross for you. That is the only way you can have the peace with God, is that you accept his perfect and final sacrifice for your sin on the cross. That he has justified you, that you are guilt-free, but not simply guilt-free, that you're considered righteous, perfect, before a holy God because of your position, because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And to know that you stand in a position of grace because of what he has done for you. And that you have a confident expectation of what's coming in the future. But for right now, this hope that we have in the future is the hope that we have now. That the God who did all of these things for us has a plan for us and has a purpose even in tribulation, even in problems. Do you know that? I'm not saying necessarily that it's always easy and that sometimes we forget that. But friend, it is crucial. It is crucial if you are going to encounter, as a believer in Christ, as a follower of Christ, if you are going to encounter the problems that inevitably come down the road, they're, they're, they're on the pike, if you will. They're, going, they're coming, and if you're not personally experiencing an issue now, you probably will. The question is, how are you going how are you going to perceive how are you going to look at that problem when it comes your way not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation works persistence endurance and that persistence and endurance uh, works uh, for, uh, makes for proven reliability and that proven reliability results in a confident expectation. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, be with each one of the folks that are listening to this 
message this evening. Help us to know that all the circumstances that we find ourselves in are under your sovereign hand, and though perhaps not good in and of themselves, can work together for good uh, in accordance with your purposes and plan for our life. Lord, help us to remember this. Help us to know it in the depths of our hearts. And we pray your, that you would uh, you would cause glory to come to yourself in the outworking of what we know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hope to see you this next Lord's Day. We're having parking lot church on May, uh, what is it, May, this coming Sunday, which would be the 11th, 10th or 11th. So hope to see you then.